Sit in the back view if you want. I uh, got to read one. And I wonder what that was. Done with this now. Maybe I should try that. It has, it has a certain flair. Can you hear me now, George? Can you hear me now, George? Yeah, good. All right, so we're just about to get started now. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. And I'm going to invite Dr. Francis Carroll to come up and introduce our warden, Arthur, Dr. Alison Abra. Thank you. Well, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Allison to you uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, every, uh, every teacher, as I'm sure you know, takes great pride uh, in the achievements of their, of their students. And I have to say that in this case, I have enormous pride in the, uh, in the wonderful achievements of, uh, of Dr. Allison Abra. She's done uh, uh, really marvelous stuff. But she was a student of mine uh, back in the, in, the, in, the, in the good old days. And, and being a part pedant uh, 
and part bureaucrat, I got out my grade book and looked at her record uh, for me. And uh, although, of course, grades are confidential, uh, I can tell, I can assure you that she did exceedingly well for me. I'm so I was so pleased that I looked because she really did wonderful work. And she went on to do more uh, wonderful work, uh, as I'm sure you all know by now. She went on to uh, Queen's University in, in Kingston and did a master's degree, and then to Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, uh, to the University of, of Michigan uh, to do her PhD. Uh, and, and so those, those were really uh, the great stepping stones uh, for, an, for an academic career. She came back here and joined us for a year as an adjunct professor, both at the college and in the history department. And so that was, that was wonderful to see her again, but she was off quickly to uh, uh, the University of, of Southern Mississippi. And they have appreciated her uh, enormously as, as well. Uh, and the, uh, within a, a, a few years of being there, the Mississippi Humanities Council uh, named her Teacher of the Year in Mississippi, which is, which is really wonderful. And, and at virtually the same time her first book came out, Dancing in the English Style, Consumption, Americanization, and National Identity in Britain, 1918 uh, to 1950, published by the University of Manchester Press uh, in, in, in 1917. Uh, and this is, a, this is an interesting book uh, which, which really looks at the, the social history of, of this incredible period after the, uh, after the First World War. But that wasn't the only accomplishment. Uh, an article that she published uh, in the 20th Century uh, British History Journal uh, won the postgraduate prize of, of 2008. So she, she was doing great things really right, to, right from the start. The, the Mississippi, Southern Mississippi University realized all of this and uh, uh, made her a fellow uh, of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society. And uh, the, the following year, uh, she was given a distinguished chair uh, the General Wilfred Blount, uh, Professor of Military Studies, 2019 uh, to 2021. Uh, and clearly her interests had shifted to some of the social dimensions of the war as well. And uh, she's working on a manuscript uh, which is tentatively titled Love and War, the Emotional History of of British secret, secret agents during World War II. And I'm sure we're going to get a preview of that. We're going to get a hint of that in her lecture to us uh, today, British Secret Service agents in World War II. Let uh, me ask you to join me in, in welcoming uh, Alison with us. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. I still always want to call him Dr. Carroll, even though he is also <laughs> Francis to me now, too. Um, that was lovely, and uh, it's so wonderful to be back here at the college and welcomed back by you in particular, my favorite professor. Um, even though I took US history from Francis, there was clearly something building, because I remember that I wrote papers for you in foreign policy class about Anglo-American relations in the American Civil War, term one. And then Anglo-American relations in World War II in term two. So I was I was getting into the British history uh, thing even then. So um, I want to welcome and thank all of you for being here this afternoon. There is something so lovely about um, this event and how it embodies what I love about the college. Because I mean, here I get to be with my new colleagues and my former teachers. And I've also met people who my grandfather straightened their teeth and you know, my parents are here. Um, so this is just to me, uh, the embodiment of what makes this college so special. Um, and I get to share my research with you and prattle on a little bit about Lady Spies. So let me just, I'm starting my timer because really I can get, I can get going with this. So um, welcome to you to those of you joining us on Zoom. I meant to say that as well. So I'm gonna kind of just try to tilt this towards myself rather than holding it, but I'm also pretty loud. So we okay? Okay. Yeah, 
So first slide. So some of you may maybe have seen this monument before. It's on the south bank of the River Thames in London, just across the water from the British Parliament building. And it is a small commemorative monument to the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. During World War II, the SOE was the branch of British intelligence that was charged with subversive warfare in the occupied territories. Hundreds of agents were sent into European countries controlled by Germany and Italy. And the SOE also had a presence in Asia as part of the war effort against the Japanese. They conducted sabotage operations, orchestrated assassinations of high ranking enemy leaders, arranged escape routes for allied military personnel, and organized local resistance um, and militaries in order to better coordinate with broader allied objectives. Now, among the SOE agents sent on missions into France during World War II were 39 women, including Violette Zabo, who you see there um, atop, her head is the bust atop the SOE monument. Oh, wrong way. For a variety of reasons, Violette Zabo has probably become SOE's most famous agent. She was the daughter of an English father and French mother who met in the First World War. And she was a young war widow when she was recruited to SOE. Her husband had been killed in the Battle of El Alamein with a baby daughter when she went off to France in 1944. Uh, yes, she was recruited in 42, got to France in 44. She did two missions to France. And on the second of these um, that began just after D-Day, she was captured at a German checkpoint, eventually sent to a concentration camp in Germany and executed alongside two other female SOE agents in early 1945. Now she was young, she was beautiful, she was at the center of a tragic wartime romance, she had a daughter, and in many ways she really well embodies a lot of the traits that came to personify the female agents accurately or inaccurately, as I'm going to explore in this talk. I think it's significant that in the grand scope of SOE operations, Zabo and the other 38 women who were women agents were a relatively small contingent. But the decision to put Violet Zabo on top of the memorial to SOE, I think attests to the big impact that they had. Especially after the war, the women agents became the stuff of legend and the subject of countless popular and academic histories memoirs, newspaper stories, public monuments, postage stamps, um, novels, <laughs> documentaries, theatrical productions, television shows. Uh, shout out to Wish Me Luck, the 1980s ITV drama that my mother introduced me to, which is really the source of all of this. Uh, great show that you should check out. Television shows, feature films, video games, and even most recently, a British reality show on Netflix that you can watch where average British people in 2020 or whatever it was, um, get trained up as an SOE agent. Here is a sampling, for instance, of cultural products just about Violette, who, as I said, has become probably the most famous of these women. So what I want to explore with you this afternoon is the history of some of the women of the SOE, but also this legacy that they have continued to have after the war how the British grappled with the challenge um, of the unconventional nature of their service, which included combat, imprisonment, in some cases, torture and death, how that posed a challenge to the gender norms of the day. And my plan is to talk a little bit about the origins of history of SOE um, and a few of its female agents before I move into a case study of one woman I'm particularly fascinated by, Odette Sansom, because I think she really embodies these contradictions that I articulated about the way these women were understood. They were valorized for their service unquestionably. In fact, Sansom, as I'll talk about, was the first woman to be bestowed with the George Cross. And yet there were strong efforts after the war to reinforce them as traditionally feminine, despite the untraditional or arguably masculine nature of their wartime experiences and accomplishments. So what was the SOE? Well, the SOE was founded during the summer of 1940 
just after France had fallen, and Britain, along with its empire and commonwealth, something I always have to remind my students in the United States, you know, there was Canada, there were other places that were still there, um, remained really the last of the Western European countries unconquered by the German Blitzkrieg and still formally at war with Nazi Germany. Subversion and sabotage were seen to be one way to keep the British war effort going on some level at least after the uh, disasters of Dunkirk and the Franco-German armistice. A war cabinet memorandum from July 19, 1940 proclaimed that a new organization shall be established to coordinate all action by way of subversion and sabotage against the enemy overseas. This organization will be known as the Special Operations Executive. Or it was put more pithily, allegedly, in the words of the war's greatest orator, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who said that the SOE was commanded to set Europe ablaze. Or maybe he didn't say that. Historians have started to say he probably didn't, but it sounds really good. So let's just go with it. So as many of you may know, it was really during World War II that espionage and subversive warfare modernized and expanded in ways that we would find familiar today. The CIA is founded out of the OSF, which was really a copycat organization of the SOE. When the Americans got into the war, they turned to the British for advice about how to set that up. And in developing the Special Operations Executive, British leaders took inspiration from guerrilla warfare tactics that they had witnessed in past military experiences. So for Churchill, he was very inspired by the Boers who had fought the British in South Africa at the turn of the century and by Lawrence of Arabia, he was a big Lawrence of Arabia fan. For um, SOE Chief Major, Sir <laughs> this one is a mouthful, Major General Sir Colin Govins, he had been very influenced by experiences um, fighting the IRA between the wars. So for obvious reasons, it's an intelligence organization. SOE operated in tremendous secrecy, both in the field and at home. Very few people knew that it existed or that the British were sending agents abroad. It had a lot of nicknames for that reason, sometimes referred to as the Baker Street Irregulars in homage to Sherlock Holmes and the fact that SOE headquarters was at Baker Street in London. They also called it Churchill's Secret Army or the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. <laughs> at its peak, it employed over 13,000 people, about a quarter of whom were women, mostly working as clerical staff, radio operators, and as I've already told you, in a small number of cases as field agents. And they were active across occupied Europe, um, which was divided into designated sectors according to country and uh, usually designated by the first letter of the country's name. So what are they doing? Well, reconnaissance and information gathering was a really critical part of their work, especially in the very early period of the occupation when no one really knew what was going on behind the lines. Just basic info about German you know, restrictions, um, the rationing system, the propaganda that was um, being produced, they needed to know that for military planning, but also in order to kind of send their agents into the field well prepared, because nothing's going to get you caught faster than having the wrong paperwork or, you know, ordering the wrong thing in a restaurant. Later in the war, agents reported on enemy troop movements, possible bombing targets for the Allied campaign, and facilitated the rescue of downed Allied aircrew. They also engaged in acts of sabotage, um, derailing trains, destroying factories, and other sites of economic or military importance to the enemy war effort. And probably their most famous um, effort in this respect was that SOE sent agents into Norway to destroy the heavy water plant that was key to <coughs> German efforts to develop the atomic bomb. That's one of their most famous operations. But really the most important thing that they were doing was to supply, coordinate, and organize local resistance in the occupied territories. And this became especially important as the Allies began to gear up for D-Day, um, and they needed the support of those local resistance uh, to support the landings. So along with SOE agents, the resistance held or destroyed bridges, roads, and so forth in order to impede German defenses and 
aid the Allied advance. They also, as we'll see in a minute, tangled with the Germans themselves behind the lines um, in a number of firefights also involving the French resistance. So women SOE agents operated almost exclusively in France, which was the so-called F section of the SOE, headed up by the two you see here, Morris Buckmaster and another major figure in F section who is incredibly fascinating in her own right, um, Vera Atkins, uh, who was sort of second in command to Buckmaster. She was from Eastern Europe, had come to Britain in the 30s, sort of a civilian contractor to SOE, eventually made a flight officer in the uh, Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And if you're interested, she is actually the subject of one of the more recent movies about the SOE, of which there are many, like I said, A Call to Spy. It's on Netflix right now, so you can check that out. <laughs> what she's most famous for is that it was Vera Atkins who, as the war was coming to an end, traveled to the continent and made it her mission to find out what had happened to all of S section's agents that had gone missing which was a significant number. So the agents that these two recruited, whether they were men or women, came from a range or a variety of backgrounds. Um, and they came to the organization in a lot of different ways. Because they operated in such secrecy, it was complicated to try to recruit people and to some extent reliant on word of mouth or previously established personal relationships. So there were military colleagues, friends, and even family members who recommended one another to F section. And it became basically a family affair with siblings, lovers, and married couples serving together in the SOE and sometimes even serving together in the field. And so, you know, Dr. Carroll said, my new book is called Love and War. This is one of the things that interests me the most. What are the ramifications of being on a mission with your brother or your boyfriend or something along those lines. For instance, F section agent Claude Dubysek recruited his sister Lise to the service. And then when he went into the field, he started a romantic relationship with his courier, Mary Catherine Herbert, who became pregnant in France while she was in the field and had a child and basically went underground until the end of the war, at which point they got married, but kind of seemingly just to give the child a name, they never really lived together after the war. Other agents were targeted from within the armed forces if they were identified as having some requisite skills, such as a good touch, as they said, on the wireless. But most of, of most of, importantly, of course, was the ability to speak the language of wherever you were going, right? And so for this reason, many SOE agents were not actually British or entirely British. Um, exiled civilians and soldiers from occupied territories were often sent back to their home country in order to conduct missions. So for instance, the Norway enterprise was largely conducted by Norwegian agents for SOE. In the case of France, there was a fair number of French Canadians <coughs> or the British and French born children of um, Anglo French marriages that had resulted from the first world war like Violette Sabo. Not surprisingly, recruiting women for this type of work was controversial. It presented a considerable challenge to the gender norms of the time to send women behind enemy lines. In fact, it was illegal, according to various different elements of British military law and the Geneva Conventions, but they found ways around it about midway through the war by mostly seconding them to something called the first aid nurse and yeomanry. And really, it was a necessity thing. They made this decision because they needed agents. France was the hardest section to find them for because most of the exiled folks that had come over with the Free French were um, you know, assigned to Charles de Gaulle's own intelligence operations. So they mostly couldn't come from um, uh, the home country directly. And there were simply a fair number of women that had the language skills and other attributes that we'll talk about that made them ideal spies. So once identified, potential agents went through a training program which determined their suitability for espionage and provided them with the practical skills they would need for their job. So spy craft, silent killing, shooting, demolition, and parachute training. And men and women received the same training and trained alongside one another at a series of schools that were established at requisitioned country houses throughout the British Isles. 
And then upon completion of their training, assuming they made it through, most agents were dropped by parachute into France, hence the parachute training. Although some were also um, landed by airplane or arrived by sea. Usually they would approach um, the French coast by submarine and then be transported from the submarine to the coastline by a small Feluca sailboat if weather conditions didn't cooperate for a parachute drop. Missions lasted anywhere from a few days to well over a year in some cases, and agents were dedicated or assigned specific tasks in a dedicated region. So just as SOE divided their operations by country, within France, there were a number of different circuits named, um, you know, you can see a few of them represented there, often for occupations like scientist or jockey. And in each network, British personnel generally included, they would have a leader and an organizer who was in charge of the circuit and responsible for building up local resistance in the area. There would be a wireless operator who sent and received coded messages back and forth to London via a suitcase size radio case, like the one you can see in the image there, um, and a courier who passed messages between circuit members, transported weapons and other supplies, and located drop zones for the British to send in more people and more material. Occasionally other personnel like demolitions or weapons experts as needed would be sent in to um, help train the, the local resistance in particular. So what were women doing? Well, all of these things, basically. There were women who served as wireless operators. The first of them um, was a woman named Nora Nyet Khan, who was the Paris-raised daughter. She had a very eclectic background. Paris-raised daughter of an Indian prince father and an American mother. She was born in Russia, but then they moved to Paris. So she had lived all over the place and she was highly educated. She had gone to university at the Sorbonne between the wars and was a published author of children's stories and fairy tales. She was recruited to SOE from the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Um, the family had fled Paris uh, for London in the early days of the invasion. And she was, when she was sent to France, she was in a really um, perilous situation really from the, the get-go. This was risky for everyone. But effectively, within a day of Nora's arrival in France, she had been assigned to the Prosper Network that operated around Paris. The whole circuit imploded. Everybody was arrested. Um, it's, it remains one of, kind of the most controversial and sort of questionable things about SOE. What happened to Prosper? Why did it collapse? Was there a secret agent? Was the security lax? And so forth. Nor eluded the net initially. And everything was such a mess on the ground that London said, we'll bring you back. Like, this is too dangerous. And she refused. She stayed in Paris for the whole summer and into the fall of 1943. She was the only connection that London had to the French resistance in Paris until eventually, unfortunately, her luck ran out and she was captured by the Germans, imprisoned in Paris, and then ultimately transferred to a German concentration camp. In mid-September 1944, um, she was executed at Dachau, along with three other women SOE agents shortly after their arrival there. There were also women who rose through the ranks to become leaders of circuits. Um, one example here is a woman named Pearl Witherington, who was also born to a British expatriate family in Paris, who had escaped back to Britain as the invasion began. And she was uh, also joined the WAF and was recruited to SOE because of her French language skills, eventually being sent back to uh, France to work as the courier to the stationer network in September of 1943. And so for about eight months, she ran around the French countryside pretending to sell cosmetics. That was her cover, when in fact, um, uh, passing messages and locating drop zones, like I said. But then in May 1944, at a very crucial point just before D-Day, the leader of her network was arrested. And so she then took things over. In fact, they reconfigured the whole territory, gave her a much bigger network, and she was effectively running a 300-mile territory between uh, Toulouse and Orléans. She reorganized everything. At this point, they had about uh, 1,500 members of the French Maquis, or the resistance, under her control. 
Um, and they played an important role in fighting the German army during the D-Day landings or in the aftermath of the D-Day landings. In fact, they were so effective that at a certain point, the Germans put a million franc bounty on Pearl's head because she was so wanted by them. Um, and at one point, they, they directly attacked her position and she, was, she and her fiance were um, kind of hiding in a field under bombardment or, un, or um, under artillery fire for 14 hours. The four different Maquis units that she was kind of coordinating ultimately presided over the surrender of 18,000 German troops. So very effective. So there were some female wireless operators, there were some female leaders, but SOE women were most often couriers. And there was a reason for that. Not just the SOE, but resistance movements across Europe generally found that women were great couriers because they were far less suspicious. Nobody thinks that a woman is going to be carrying guns in the baby carriage that she's wheeling down the street. They also have more natural camouflage. Purses, you know, can cover up all kinds of things, right? Um, there were also examples of women being able to flirt their way out of trouble. All of these ways that women could just dodge scrutiny because the gender norms of the day made you assume they were not spies, right? There were also practical reasons in France that women were just inherently less suspicious because it really was by that point, a country of women. Um, there were 2 million almost French soldiers still as prisoners of war after the fall of France. From 1943, men of military service age effectively had to register for forced labor in Germany. So if you were kind of a younger man walking down the street in France in 1942, you were instantly suspicious, especially as the war progressed. And so women just had a lot, um, drew a lot less attention to themselves. So even with the advantage of gender, um, this was risky work all around, however. In total, slightly under 500 SOE agents were sent to France over the course of the war, and about 25% of them died in the field. Some from natural causes, some in combat conditions, but most owing to arrest, deportation, um, and execution in a German concentration camp. The dead included 15 women, um, 12 were executed by the Germans, two died in the course of their imprisonment, and one um, got sick in the field and, and uh, died of natural causes. And I've mentioned already Nuranya Khan and Violet Zabo's deaths. They were both part of three mass executions of SOE women, where um, on one occasion at Ravensbrück, on one occasion at Dachau, uh, four, three or four women were killed together. The other example, there occurred at um, Natzweiler Struhoff in June of 1944. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to go to Natzweiler a couple of, well, pre-pandemic uh, 2018 with some students from Southern Miss. Um, and I didn't know about this before we got there, but my colleague said, no, the British women, you have to go see where the British women um, uh, were killed. And so, you know, we, we toured the, the camp with our students. And then about a month later, the program ended and I went to London and I was doing research for my book project and I found the affidavits that Vera Atkins had collected from people that had been in the prison that described what had happened to these women. And, you know, I'd just been there. So it was so vivid. And so just these, these four women really haunt me. So SME continued its operations only for the duration. It was shuttered in 1946. Through some of its staff, and uh, though some of its staff and operations would get absorbed into other parts of the British intelligence apparatus. Um, and the fact that it ceased to exist accounts for the reason that the secrecy that had surrounded it in the war dissolved almost immediately. Like you've seen, lots of um, famous accounts of SOE agents. In fact, the news that the British had been sending women behind the lines broke even before the war was over. And the trigger for this was a series of news stories. In fact, some of them in the Canadian press, we were troublemakers apparently for the SOE, about one agent in particular, Sonia Butt, who had married a French Canadian SOE officer, Guy Deltois, um, who she had met in training. They had gone into the field separately with her mission done. She had moved to Montreal um, to you know, stay with his family while he continued his service in uh, Asia. And they made the local news, and it then got picked up by the British press in, the, in late 1944. And what's interesting about this coverage is that 
Sonia Butt's work as a courier and saboteur in um, occupied France was strongly described in these articles. It was certainly emphasized and celebrated. But as you can see from this headline, they also loved the love story. They loved being able to reinforce that their romance had begun as they jumped into German lines, which is not when it began, by the way. But, you know, it's, it's a better story. Um, and that they could then reinforce also now she's gone to move to Montreal. She's pregnant. She's settling into domestic bliss as a Canadian war bride. There was a similar pattern, I am arguing, that was observable as more accounts of women secret agents started to percolate after the war. There was this tension in their representation between recognizing and respecting the work that they had done, but also the effort to kind of mitigate the challenge that that was posing to gender norms. And this was a tension that historians have identified more broadly in post-1945 gender relations, but with the women agents, who had you know, received combat training and been in combat in some cases, um, who had been you know, arrested, tortured, in some cases executed, it was even more crucial to kind of reinforce them as traditionally feminine. And so I think one of the ways that they did that was through an emphasis on their romantic relationships and the retreat into domestic bliss that this generally then would accompany. So in news stories, memoirs and biographies, feature films, all of those cultural products that started to emerge, the women agents work in France was taken seriously and honored in many respects. But it was also often treated as a temporary interlude for the sake of the war effort and sharply contrasted with their more traditional post-war lives. And one great example here was a newspaper article, January 1947, about agent Marguerite Peggy Knight, entitled Mrs. Smith, train wrecker, spy, and Nazi killer. The piece set, opens by saying, you would not suspect that the prim little woman who comes out of the newly built house, wheeling her 16 month and four month old babies in a second hand pram with a shopping bag on the handrail, once blazed away with a stem gun at Germans hunting her down as a secret agent in France. And then throughout the article, similar juxtapositions occurred. Her handbag contained a shopping list, whereas once it had held a suitcase, or she'd once held a suitcase with coded messages and a radio set. Now her eyes scoured the shops for apples for her baby. They had previously scouted German military strong points. <laughs> While during the war, she had been part of a sabotage mission to blow up a German troop train. Now the most, quote, the most exciting thing in her life is to watch her children grow up. And so it was this back and forth. And then you can see this is a photograph that accompanied it that I love. It's, it's Peggy, you know, playing on the floor of her new great 1940s house that she's purchased with her Royal Navy um, husband, Croix de Guerre, MBE, um, mother. Yeah. So you see this kind of back and forth between they're not hiding what these women did, but they're trying to balance it out by the more traditional life that they led after the war. And to kind of really reinforce that, that contradiction, I want to conclude by telling you about one particular agent. Just going to check my time here. Okay, yes. So, like I said, Odette Sansom, one of my favorites of the women agents, was born Odette Braillet in Amiens, France, the daughter of a bank manager who was killed at Verdun in the First World War. She met an Englishman, Roy Sansom, um, and married him in 1931, moving with him to Britain, where they had three daughters, Francoise, Lily, and Marianne. At the start of World War II, Roy joined the army, and Odette moved with the children to Somerset to escape from the bombing in London. And she came to the attention of SOE in a very roundabout way. In the spring of 1942, the British Admiralty sent out a plea in the newspapers and on the radio for any kind of holiday snaps or family photos that people had of the French countryside or the French coastline in particular um, that would help with military planning. And so Odette had a lot of pictures, so she sent them in, but she sent them to the war office instead of the Admiralty by mistake, which brought her to the attention of SOE. And so they approached her about becoming an agent and she initially, as you probably guess, was like, are you kidding? I've got three children, this is nuts. 
Um, but eventually she did decide to serve out of a sense of duty to both of her countries, right? Particularly, she did an interview with the Imperial War Museum after the war, where she talked about how once she started the training, which she assumed she was going to flunk out of anyway and the whole thing would be resolved, she, was, she had access to information that your average British person did not about what was actually happening in France. And then she felt very compelled to go back and help out the family that was still there. She still had a brother, her mother, all of these folks still in France. And so she was one of the first women to go. She arrived in France by sea um, near Cannes in November of 1942 to join the Spindle Network as a courier, working under another SOE agent named Peter Churchill. Note the name. <laughs> so for the next few months, they worked closely together. She liaised with the resistance there. Um, they, she organized weapons drops. Churchill went back to London for a few weeks to be debriefed, and she ran the circuit in his absence. They also seemed to have fallen in love during this period and um, entered into a romantic relationship of some sort and were staying in the same hotel as kind of their headquarters. I know it sounds questionable and people pointed this out later, but yes, they were in the same hotel when they were arrested in April of 1943. Um, just like Nouring Khan and Violet Zabo, Odette was sent to friend prison in Paris. Um, but as they were captured, she and Churchill, mostly she, this was her grand strategy, were able to convince the Germans that he was some relation of Winston Churchill, which he was not, and that she was his wife, because frequently their cover story in the field had been as man and wife. And so for that reason, seemingly, um, despite the fact they both were in German custody for over a year, they were never executed. In fact, Odette was one of the only women SOE agents who actually was sentenced to death, but was never actually executed. <coughs> and Peter ended up having sort of a privileged status with the Germans. In fact, early on, it's hard to tell how, how high up this went, but there was some talk, maybe we can trade him, you know, he's, he's Churchill's nephew or something, um, for Rudolf Hess. That was a plan that people had cooked up. And so, so they were not executed, although Odette did endure very brutal torture by the Germans um, and solitary confinement at Ravensburg concentration camp for over a year. She was not, in fact, put to work there like most women would be because of this privileged status, but you know, basically sat in the dark for long periods of time. At one point, they denied her food for a week because um, of the Allied landing in the south of France. This was apparently her fault, according to the commandant of Ravensbrück. And yet, like I said, she was never executed. In fact, when the Allies were only a few miles away from Ravensbrück, the camp commandant came to Odette's cell one night, picked her up, put her in a car, and drove with her to American lines, where he kind of turned up and said, um, you know, I, this is Frau Churchill. She has, been a, she has been a prisoner. And apparently Odette said to the Americans, this is the commandant of Ravensbrück. Please make him a prisoner. <laughs> Um, she made him give her his gun, which is a nice little touch. Um, and Churchill, meanwhile, had also survived the war because of this more kind of exalted status. Um, and they were reunited in London in May of 1945. She divorced her husband, and they got married in 1947, although they too divorced a decade later, and she ended up remarrying a third time to another SOE agent she had not served with, um, who she was with until her death in 1995. So that's kind of her history. How she came to public attention was that in 1946, as I said at the beginning, she was awarded the George Cross, which was Britain's highest award for bravery. There are complicated distinctions, but effectively the George Cross was the so all, civilian's not quite right, but that's how it gets phrased, the civilian equivalent to the Victoria Cross. So this was a big deal for a woman to be given this. And that same year, she testified at the war crimes trials dedicated to the Ravensbrück camp and was um, crucial to the conviction of the commandant there. These events got a lot of press coverage, but so did her wedding to Churchill. Um, by 1949, a biography of her experience was written and it was turned into a feature film. You can see the poster there. And so what I think is really important about these um, different ways that she summoned public attention is that in all of these narratives, she was definitely a war hero, but she was also a romantic heroine. When she was awarded her George Cross, 
At the same ceremony of Buckingham Palace, uh, where Churchill got a distinguished service order, the news coverage, as you can see, was as much about the revelation of their engagement as it was their service in F section. There were newspaper headlines that talked about, I mean, this is an official honor ceremony with the king, right? And they're like, secret service romance. <laughs> um, in addition, because her George Cross was awarded largely for her refusal to speak under torture, which protected other members of her group, including Churchill, they could kind of narratively fuse those two things together and say, you know, to wed the officer, she saved. Um, in subsequent news items over the next little while, because she was she became very famous, fashion columns, they would go out on the town and it would get attention. They would often call her the George Cross Bride, which is like military honor, spouse, all <laughs> wedded together. And also, you know, she was often photographed with her children. That's one of her daughters at the, at the George Cross ceremony with them as well. She was often photographed with Violette Zabo's daughter as well, because Violette had been killed leaving this orphan daughter. And so, you know, Odette always said she felt a responsibility to kind of speak for the women who hadn't made it back and, you know, um, was, was photographed with uh, Violette's daughter quite a lot. So she's a very maternal figure as well. Then when they got married in 1947, it got a lot of press coverage yet again, a lengthy profile of the Sunday pictorial. It was the subject of a Pathé newsreel. Again, the stories always made these shifts back and forth between um, you know, wedding day in London and service in France. And the piece you see there closed by describing Sansom and Churchill as being at the center of, quote, the greatest love story of the generation. Subsequent biographical accounts and especially the cinematic treatment took a similar approach. The 1950 film Odette, some of you may have seen it, is essentially a love story. It actually fairly accurately account, recounts what went on in France in terms of their operations, but at the heart of the whole thing is Odette and Peter gradually falling in love. <laughs> so I think there was a particular emphasis in post-war representations of certain SOE agents, right? The ones who were young, conventionally attractive, maternal, and at the center of these big wartime romances, which did important work for kind of managing those anxieties about the challenge their service had uh, posed to the gender system. Interestingly though, even though her decision to divorce her husband and marry Churchill had kind of created a you know, respectable ending to the fact that this relationship had seemingly begun in, uh, in the field while she was married, there clearly was disapproval of her behavior behind the scenes, which finally exploded in the kind of mid to late 1950s. And one of the triggers, remember the hotel? One of the triggers was the publication in 1956 of a memoir by Hugo Bleicher, who was the German counterintelligence officer who had arrested them. And it painted a very different portrait of Odette than the one that had been so prevalent since the war, where she was you know, like this chaste, martyred mother type figure. Now she was described as a voluptuous Matahari who used sex appeal to carry out her work. He also claimed that when he arrested Sansom and Churchill, he found them in the midst of a romantic reunion because Peter had just returned from London where Odette was roaming the, ha the halls in a negligee and Peter was lounging in bed waiting for her return with some cigarettes, which is definitely not what happened. They were in a hotel, but they were in different rooms. He was asleep. Yes, it was definitely not that. But this was, you know, salacious. It was, you know, and it was egged on by the fact that they had just gotten divorced, right? Which in the 1950s, now she was a divorcee twice over. This did not jive with the image that they were trying to create about her. And it got a lot of attention. So much so that Odette gave an interview where she laughed off this representation of events saying, I'm not that sort of a woman. But there clearly were those who thought she was. Most notably, conservative MP Dame Irene Ward began what would become a years long campaign to strip Odette Sansom of her George Cross, writing in a 1959 letter to Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, what really concerns me is that it should have been considered to appropriate to, uh, oh, pardon me, to recommend to the monarch that the first woman to be given the George Cross should have an undoubted black mark against her name. The fact that the original behavior by Odette and Peter Churchill was well known, and yet she was still the first woman 
absolutely shatters my belief in justice. What's funny about Ward is she actually was one who's very invested in making sure that the women of the SOE got their got their due. She thought not enough of them had been, um, you know, presented with military decorations or gotten the attention that Odette Sanson had gotten, who clearly Ward felt was unworthy of it because she was sort of, you know, um, a promiscuous woman. Also, she was French. She didn't like that. That becomes that, be, that is very clear in the documents that to have given the George Cross to a French woman was very offensive. Um, and so this also, meanwhile, contributes to, but also becomes entangled in another controversy that was starting to brew at the time about SOE more broadly, that it had been a completely ineffective organization, that a bunch of agents had been sent or hundreds of agents had been sent to their desks um, basically, uh, uh, you know, for no reason that they had not been effective, particularly the Prosper Network that Noor and Yit Khan was part of had been a disaster. And it became a huge public controversy. It's being talked about on the floors of Parliament. Eventually, it caused the British government to commission an official history of the SOE, which was authored by Oxford historian and former intelligence officer M.R.D. Foote. Didn't really solve the problems, though, <laughs> because... When it was first published in 1966, it spawned yet another stream of press coverage about SOE's most famous agents. Because MRD Foote claimed that the activities of Odette Sansom and Peter Churchill in France had been slight in terms of military value, and that their circuit had been brought down as much by their love of luxury as other factors, suggested that life could still be pretty easy for people with plenty of money on the Riviera even under occupation. Most egregiously, Foote also claimed that none of the women agents had actually been tortured by the Germans, that this had been blown up and um, you know, exaggerated in these post-war accounts. Even though Odette Sansom was alive and on disability or compensation because of the severity of the effects of her, um, her torture, he denied this, saying that her account of her experience as being tortured was, was owing to her state of, quote, nervous tension upon her release from captivity and difficulty distinguishing fantasy from reality, which always this cues my feminist rage. Like, yeah, let's not trust her when she tells us that she was tortured. So in response, Sansom and Churchill, they'd broken up by this point, but they were united. They sued Foote and the government for defamation, and the book was revised in subsequent editions. <clears throat> Why I think this is important, though, is that the, the kind of debate or the controversy about M.R.D. Foote's book, Irene Ward's open challenge to Sansom, her, Sansom's heroism, basically because of her sexual history, is really a, illustrative about how the representation of these women, whether it was to kind of celebrate them or to condemn them, was always being influenced by ideas about appropriate or traditional feminine behavior whether it was how you were supposed to behave in a romantic relationship or how you would respond to imprisonment and torture. So to conclude, I think you can see in the history of the women of the SOE a really important window, not only into kind of wartime gender relations, but post-war gender relations. In an era of Rosie the Riveter and expanding roles for women in all kinds of respects during the war, these women really embodied the apex of wartime service. But they also show us the strong efforts to contain the social transformation that was possible owing to that service and the strong reassertion of traditional domestic roles for women after the war. Of course, the post-war examples that I've talked to you about today are really only from the 1940s, 50s, and early 60s. As I showed at the start, representations of the women of the SOE have shifted a lot as more documents have come out and gender norms have shifted as we've moved into the 21st century. And so given their continued popularity really for the last 80 years in all kinds of different respects, I think they have a lot to tell us about the different ways that women have been received or viewed for all of that history, not just the 40s and 50s. Thank you very much. Nobody has any questions. I don't believe that. There we go. First of all, I'd like to say 
this has been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you. I think one of the greatest we've ever had. And we've had some very fine ones. Well, this thank you. It's just wonderful. Um, and it, it demonstrates your, your thesis of very clearly of what it was like to be a woman in the war effort in the Second World War. And, you know, a lot of us were growing up at that time because we're kind of old. <laughs> and and I, I can still feel in myself the kind of gender relationships that you're talking about. And because I'm kind of stubborn, they haven't really changed as much as they probably should have. And I'm just wondering what's your take? And if there were a world war now, how would women be treated? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And, um, you know, having been in the U.S. for the last 10 years, well, you've probably seen there, there's been a lot of debate about combat roles for women in the U.S. military and, and everything has now been opened up on an equal level. The big debate about that for a long time was the draft, right? Because the U.S. still has a draft. If, if women, um, if there, if, if women could do, yes, if we, if women were are now eligible for all different kinds of service roles, should they not also be eligible for the draft? Which a lot of feminists say yes. I mean, I I don't know if I have a clear answer to it, other than I think that, like anything, it's been a slow process where we, they clearly are in a more equal position vis-a-vis -vis the military now or any other roles that might emerge in a world war, um, and that comes with you know pros and cons, right? Because I mean, you know. I think the equality piece is incredibly important, but a lot of people have a lot of discomfort with the idea of women being drafted into military service, right? And a lot of women probably don't want to be drafted into military <laughs> service, just as many men did not want to be drafted into military service in previous eras. But but that I think we have come a pretty long way in that respect, and yet there are these lingering pullovers as well. That's not a very effective answer to think about this a little bit more, but I think the legacies are still there. Um, and, and the remnants are there. And yet the way we look at these documents, I mean, just the fact that I can look at what he was, in, he was an academic historian. What he wrote in the 60s, just like sets my blood boiling now. I mean, you know, just, we, we certainly do not have an acceptance of the same um, sorts of, of views of, of women's capabilities. And yet I don't think we've broken down those walls altogether. Yeah, I don't know if that is a good answer. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question, though. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention that we have a granddaughter in fourth year at Royal Military College. Nice. And she is in intelligence. Oh, really? So I'm wondering what that will entail. And I'm yeah. almost like I've never been told. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for her. Yeah. And I mean, intelligence, like everything, has shifted. And one thing, getting into this project has been interesting because one thing that I've learned over and over is is just the the shifting perception of espionage and intelligence and these debates about how effective the SOE was had circulate around intelligence kind of throughout history. Like, is espionage effective? And yet we're all fascinated by it, right? I mean, it's this this really interesting question. And one one thing I kind of changed up how I refer to these women. I always called them my lady spies, but I've recently started to refer to them more as secret agents because some people get upset if you call them spies because they actually were combatants, right? They, most of them had a military association. Like spy seems to imply this kind of nefariousness that people get upset about. Um, I don't know how I feel about that actually, but, but it feels like in this part of, or this sector of academic history, language matters. And so this is something I've learned going through this project and that they are more accurately referred to as secret agents, which apparently has a semantic distinction from spies. So, yeah, yeah. Allison, on behalf of all of us gathered here, let me thank you so much. Thank you. For this wonderful insight into the Debbie world of secret operations and the super Debbie world of women's role in those operations. This has been most interesting and insightful afternoon.
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Thank you all.